My name's Larry O'Donnell. I'm the chairman of the Centennial Committee for Our Savior's Lutheran Church. With me today is June Ramstead, who is a historian with the church who's done much to assemble a written record of our 100-year history as a congregation. And today, we're standing at the very first site at the corner of 25th and Harrison. To get you kind of oriented, we're in one of the oldest sections of the city of Everett, in the part of town known as Riverside. Over on Riverside, they really got the jump on the Everett Land Company that Hewitt had formed, and Mr. Swalwell started selling lots here in the fall of 1891. So it was natural then, in the spring of 1892, when a group was looking to start a church, that uh, they would be located somewhere in the riverside uh, where we're standing today. And our first pastor was J.K. Moses. He served the church for two years, and then in the next few years, there were three other pastors. Well, everyone went through a tremendous boom time in 1892, but things began to sour in 1893. And it wasn't until 1900 that Everett really got back on its feet. And in the early part of the 20th century then, we had the Port Gardner Bay Area and the Snohomish River ringed with lumber and shake and shingle mills. And Everett had started a new era, an era which once again brought prosperity, and this was the era of Milltown Everett. It was about this time that the church then, in examining uh, the building that it had started came to the conclusion that maybe they should move to a location that was going to be more of the center of the community and be in a better position to serve the community needs. Here we are at the site of the Our Savior's Lutheran Church after it moved from the 25th and Harrison over to close to Hewitt and Lombard. We're in the 2900 block of Lombard on the west side of the street. This seemed like a good location. It was close to the downtown, close to the residential area that was developing around here. Reverend and Mrs. Foss worked very hard in this pioneering town and they raised 10 children here. And uh, he worked until with us until 1912. When the move was made here, Everett was going through its mill town boom, and uh, the city was really enjoying prosperity, and so was the church. And as the church prospered and grew, uh, they sadly lost uh, Pastor Foss. But when he left, another gentleman was called here, Carl Norgard. The call evidently came because the pastor of the church at that time was Ludwig Foss. And he um, was elected president, I believe, they called them foreman in those days, of the Norwegian Lutheran Church in this district. The uh, Foss family was a large family. So we, we three at first, and then my brother and sister making us five, moved into a spacious parsonage. Well, I call it a Norwegian Gothic architecture. It was a Gothic architecture, single aisle. Uh, at that time, I thought it was a long aisle, but I think it was a very few feet long. The first memory of being in a church was up at Swan's Trail. Yeah. You see, we were still living out of Swan, uh, out of Homemakers at the time, and uh, Pastor Norgard would come out from Everett on Sundays afternoons <coughs> for our services at the church up at Swan's Trail. Well, it was part of the call. Swan's Trail is a, a farming community just east of Everett, between Everett and Snohomish. And there was a Norwegian Lutheran church in Swan's Trail, a small congregation serving that farming area. And um, it was part, as I say, of the call. If you accepted a call to Everett, you also served this small congregation. I never went to the church on Lombard, but my oldest sister was confirmed in, in Norwegian at uh, um, Lombard. Yes, Norwegian was used in the congregation a lot. In fact, ours was a bilingual congregation for many years. 
and alternate Sunday services were conducted in Norwegian. It was very nice for people, new people coming to Everett, maybe immigrants, to know that there was a Norwegian Lutheran Church in Everett, and there were two. Uh, what is now a Central Lutheran Church was also a Norwegian Lutheran Church in Everett at that time, because this was a highly Scandinavian-oriented society for many years. The congregation did flourish then in the early 1920s, and by 1921 had a new constitution, uh, more membership, and was rapidly outgrowing this location. And there was just uh, so much space here, so they began looking for a new site and settled on the location at the corner of 24th and Hoyt. Yes, I was. Uh, those are rather exciting times for this little congregation and for my father. We uh, worshipped in the basement of that church for maybe a year or so, enough so that I know there was a confirmation service down there. So I think that day we had our service down in the basement of the church and then all walked outside to actually have the laying of the cornerstone. This was a time of great excitement and celebration to move into this facility and the location uh, was again a reflection of the congregation wanting to move where they felt the greatest need would be in the community. It was Romanesque meaning it did not have a center aisle, and that was a bit of a controversy. How are our brides going to get married if they don't have a center aisle to walk down? We brought the pump organ up to that church that was there for quite a while, and it was situated over on the side by one of the windows to the left of the sanctuary. We used the old pulpit from the other church, and it was painted to, of course, coordinate with the interior and also the old baptismal font. They were later replaced with beautiful um, wooden, carved wooden altar and pulpit and uh, baptismal font. And that added a lot to the sanctuary, I thought. They got my husband to do that building, and Nils Gog was the one that did the hand carving on it. And then he'd put it onto the whatever he built. And he built the chairs, one chair on each side, you know, and upholstered them in red. Built the altar, and there was another cross behind that was lit from behind. The move was actually made in 1925, 24 and 25, when business was booming. But of course, they had a loan at the bank, and the paying back of that loan wasn't done until 1929, the time of the crash in the 30s during the Depression. So finances were a real problem at that time. Yes, the women of the church made lots of money for the, for the congregation by annual dinners. I think mostly their annual loot fisk and baked ham dinner that they kind of opened to the public. So this is the site then where the congregation spent the remaining of those roaring 20s, uh, those difficult years of the Depression, the traumatic years of World War II and the Korean War, and uh, well into that post-World War II boom. But for those 40 years, even though there might have been a little friction now and then, it was generally a marvelously supportive congregation of my mother and father. And they had a very happy 40 years. In 1951, he retired, and Pastor Milton Nessie was called here. And uh, that was the best Luther League they've had for a long time. He really was interested in the children and got them all to come. And I remember he'd, kids would be outside playing, you know, and it was time to start, and he'd go to the door and holler at him. He had such a good voice. <laughs> I can remember him coming out in the car and packing that station wagon for the kids uh, for their activities and the junior choir and the vacation Bible school and for uh, the many different activities that they had. He was so open and um, himself 
and accepting and loving. And he and Katie were really uh, dear role models. Pastor Nessie had talked about, you know, not wanting someone to help in the office because they wondered if there was anybody that wanted to do it. And uh, I was rather reluctant, but my husband thought I ought to go do that. So he went up and asked Pastor Nessie. <laughs> and sure, they wanted me. So I thought, well, I'll try it. <laughs> there were some changes, evidently, in the... Um, how to raise the money because they had been depending on the ladies aid to have all these dinners and everything you know before and they did a good job they you know they paid for the parsonage and everything and I don't remember just when it was but um, I do remember that it was hard for some of the older ones to give up a tradition that had been with them for a lot of years. I do remember um, that we had um, a real instruction and, and change in a convincing way too that you support your church. I wouldn't say it was the first time that envelopes were used but I would say it was the first time that pledging was used. The rather interesting Going back into Norgard's day, I don't like to always go back, but these things pop up. But you could just about tell sometimes how many times a person had been been to church because they would publish a list on on how much everybody gave by name, and if and if if they gave fifty-two dollars, they'd been to church fifty-two times. Pastor Nessie was here until about 1960, left to go to Bremerton, and at that time. Pastor Lowell Knutson came to be the lead minister at the church. And Lowell Knutson was a community of our saviors in the community, and everybody in the community knew that Lowell, that Lowell Knutson was part of our saviors with their church. So I could see that we needed more room. We just didn't have enough room. And we were getting so crowded downtown, there was no place to park. And there was a Sunday school class in the kitchen. There probably were, I don't know how many, downstairs separated by curtains. And there was also a Sunday school class in the hall. So we knew that we had a, a big space problem. All the women, most of the elderly women, we, we need more Sunday school space. And that was one of the big factors, I think, of why they decided to move. The first thing, of course, was that a design had been made f to remodel. And from the, from the design of Harry Bodish, it was decided that they would need, I think, $100,000 to remodel that location on 24th and Hoyt. And in the process of doing so, uh, a major fund grab was involved. Well, I'm sure nobody knew that we were going to reach 150000 or perhaps even reach anywhere near 100000 because it had never been tried. But I do remember going to a lot of meetings, and I do remember that how it evolved, that it just was not feasible to remodel on Hoyt. They decided there had to be a vote of the whole congregation, and to do this vote it needed to be proper, that everyone who wanted to vote should vote. So they had the church open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on June 6th, and a majority of the congregation did vote and voted to move. Actually, the vote was 209 to 124. It was a big commitment, and uh, there were many who didn't feel it was necessary that we should remodel and continue as we were. So it was a, it was a very controversial uh, move, and uh, it caused some pain. When I came up to see him, he talked to me in his office there and he said, well, let me take you out to the new area where we're going to be, this out on Muckleteal Boulevard. So we, we took a ride out here and he showed me the property where this new church was going to be. There was a, a house uh, on the property and a, a kind of small white house and a little barn and there were chickens right out here and a, a 
cow and another kind of animals. He said, well, that's where the church is going to be. And it was a nine and a half acre site approximately uh, with the big ravine in there, uh, but more than enough land for anybody to do whatever they wanted to do. We had a lot of people in this congregation that participated in writing the plan that went to the architect, not what it should look like, but what we wanted to program into this new, brand new facility. One of the, uh, the organizations of the old church that thought this was their demise, but they didn't know how they would ever uh, be able to function out in a new area, was the ladies' aid. The, the last uh, ladies' aid meeting that they had was a very sad affair. They thought that this was the, the end of it. And Lowell Knudsen, Pastor Lowell Knudsen was there, of course. They dearly loved Pastor Knudsen. Um, and he said, well, he said, just don't worry. When we get out to our new building, I'll, I'm going to serve the first meeting that we have out there, which he did. Here we are at a location that's certainly familiar to any of us who belong to our Savior's Lutheran Church today. Our present site at Olympic and Moncalteo Boulevard is certainly one of the geographical landmarks out in this part of the city of Everett. We started building a church, and of course, at the time, I, I, I was contracting, and I had to, I bid it, I think there was five of us bidding it, and it just so happened or, that I was a low bidder. Well, I don't know that I was ever on site more than two or three days, but Lowell Knudsen was out here every day driving in nails and doing this and doing that, and I can remember even Chet Soley on the day they put up the six major beams and the, and the six support beams. And all this whole thing hinged on was those beams being craned up there and hooking on to that big piece of round steel that sits up there, and you can see it from inside the roof here. Well, it took a lot of figuring, one heck of a lot of engineering figuring, but, uh, and we had to have two, two cranes. We had two separate glue lambs, and we had to have one we anchored this big, it's a compression ring that's up there. And once we got the two of them up, they were, they were shoving against each other, and so it worked out. Uh, and we, of course, we had it braced and everything, and then we immediately went and put the others in, and it all went together. But it took a lot of, a lot of figuring. But it worked. It actually worked. And it was a fantastic thing. So that was an exciting time, too, as we saw the building being erected. And there was much activity. And of course, the location, we'd have to pass the new building site to attend worship at Beer Ridge School. It was Easter in 1968 when we had our first service in the new building. We were under the new roof, but there weren't too many walls on the building, and it was a rainy and windy day, so it was not very comfortable. The second service we had back over at the View Ridge School. And we stayed at the school until August 11th. And then we had our first formal service in this building. There was certainly indication that the right decision has, had been made to come out to this part of Everett because the growth that had been anticipated did occur. The Boeing Company, of course, had their big plant out on Casino, which uh, continued to expand and thrive, and Everett had moved from its mill town economy into a new aircraft and high-tech sort of economy. And our Savior's Lutheran Church, once again, was uh, out where the action is. It's kind of an ironic twist. We moved from downtown, and we were rebuilding downtown because our Sunday school conditions were a mess. <laughs> we were meeting in the basement with portables and slap walls and all this kind of stuff. After the sanctuary and the church was built, we still didn't have any, any Sunday school room. No Sunday school space and, and no kitchen. On the plan and stuff, original plan that we were looking at, we had other buildings we were going to service, but we didn't have enough money. But finally got to the point that Olga and Hans Soli said, that's enough. <laughs> we're tired of being crammed into this thing before we go. Well, we want to see a social hall. So they provided it, the monies, Chet Soli built it, and the family built it, and we have this the fantastic social hall that we have today. Now. And it uh, turned out real good. But it still wasn't enough room, we found out later on. And then my son comes along, and he, he was following in his grandpa's steps, my steps, and he's contracting now, and 
and he built this new addition. It just seemed like it was such a um, wonderful thing that the, that family continued on to do so much for the building. Of course, it certainly took the money from the congregation to accomplish this. And uh, I think that people have been very supportive, but it still, <laughs> it still takes some doing to make those payments. And so for 20 years, you know, we have struggled, uh, over 20 years, we struggled with the lack of space. Um, now we have it. And I know the changes in facility are just some of the many changes that occurred uh, once we were relocated out here. Uh, certainly changes in program and changes in ministers. In 1973, after serving this congregation for 13 years, Pastor Lowell Knudsen was called to West Seattle and left us. And at that time, Pastor Ron Tellefson came to our saviors. And Ron served here until 1977. And at that time, uh, after a very vigorous ministry here, he left to serve on the staff of Pacific Lutheran University. I also worked under Pastor Tellefson, and that's when I had to retire because my eyes just wouldn't do the work anymore. <laughs> so I feel, feel very uh, thankful that I was able to serve in the congregation for 10 years as, as a member of the staff. That, that would be one-tenth, I guess, of the 100 years that this congregation has been established. Then Pastor Don Taylor, who had spent uh, much of his recent years in the Lutheran Outdoor Ministry Program, uh, felt the need to get back to a congregation. And we were fortunate to be the congregation uh, to which he was called. So from 1977 up until 1982, uh, Pastor Taylor served in this location as the senior minister at Our Savior's Lutheran. And then uh, when he left, uh, Pastor Joe Albu came to the church, and Pastor Albu served here from 1983 then for seven years up until 1990. What I remember most about Joe is that uh, he was such, so sensitive and so caring for everybody. Also, he had a mind that was 10 jumps ahead of everyone, too. And then when we suddenly were without Pastor Albu, uh, Pastor Parks uh, really uh, came through and uh, really held the church together and said the things that we needed to hear. Pastor Winkle has so many gifts for ministry. And we truly are blessed now with the two pastors that we have. I think they work together beautifully and do it like it should be done. So there's been changes uh, in facilities, changes in pastors, certainly a lot of changes in program. Well, I certainly think that there has been an, a, a growing awareness, uh, social concerns in the church in the last 40 years. A lot of difference. I think the church was more or less self-contained and took care of their own as the need arose. But no, as to branching out into uh, community projects now, I just don't remember that at all. Not at all. It's been really exciting to me to see how women have emerged in the church. It took a long time. Uh, when I f first became a part of Our Saviors, women were not a part of worship. Uh, women had their role in Sunday school and in circle and with the women's organization. They're doing a very good, very good job, and, and I'm glad to see that. And it doesn't bother me to see them passing the, the plate down the aisle or, or, or up there giving a, a, um, uh, a temple talk. In our congregation, uh, one of the first changes that, that uh, we, uh, we, I noted is that our church council formerly was almost all men, although uh, it was a forerunner probably in having women on the church council. 
back in the old days, the president was was a male. The the uh, vice president was a male. Uh, the secretary was a female. Oh, men were the ushers. If, if there's one constant that I guess I would mention um, in the church, it's the feeling of community. It's our saviors is our family. And um, this is where we worship together, we care about each other, uh, we support each other. It's a place to come when you're hurting. Uh, in terms of my personal needs, I come to church um, as often as I'm around, and that's nearly every Sunday, for communion. That's my role. My, that's the most important thing to me on Sunday morning. You can be whoever you are, and everybody knows you're, you're not the perfect soul that you'd like to be and that you screwed up all week long and that everybody else has done the same thing. I don't know about the future. I think that right now the church is exploring some different things. There's talk about how traditional we need to remain, how flexible we need to be to attract others. And I have a feeling that we'll never be satisfied of doing enough for our people internally. And if we continue to place our emphasis on the internal working of the church, this church, this location, uh, I think we will die. We can't remain stagnant. We need to explore some of these things. What will come of them? I don't know. The church should continue, I hope, as it has continued, in the Word. And preaching the Word in its truth and purity, law and gospel, and administer the sacraments and stick to what the church is in this world for to save souls, and to sanctify lives. And that covers a lot. And to me, if that is done, everything else should fall into place.